Demystifying the Paleo Diet Part 2. In Part 1, we discuss where we went wrong and how we ended up in such a mess. In this next part, I'm going to give you some good news. I'm going to tell you how to select the diet that's right for you. You are what you eat. You've heard those words. We can look into nature and we can see big, strong animals eating very different diets. Look at the gorilla. Their diet is comprised mostly of grass. Should we eat grass? In order to answer that question, we're going to look at the actual diet of a gorilla. The gorilla eats a diet that is mostly fiber. In fact, 74% of their diet is composed of fiber. And only 0.5%, less of one percentage point of their diet, is actually comprised of fat. Should we all eat like a gorilla to be big and strong? Before we can answer that question, we need to look at the digestive system. The digestive system is comprised of three major parts. You have the stomach, you have the large intestine, and you have the small intestine. And each one of these parts does something very different. You've heard that your digestion starts in your mouth when you start chewing on food and breaking it into smaller particles. Well, the next step is going down to the stomach and actually breaking it down with the use of hydrochloric acid, making it even more digestible. After that, it goes into the small intestine. And in the small intestine, we absorb whatever is able to absorb from that food that has been processed, and it goes directly into the bloodstream. After we absorb those nutrients in the small intestine, it goes into the large intestine. In the large intestine, the food is transformed. What do I mean by that? Well, it's dehydrated to absorb as much water from the food as possible. And there's this tiny little organisms, you've heard of them, the probiota, that actually break down whatever we couldn't break down by chewing or in the stomach, and they transform these nutrients into something else. Now, let's go back to our gorilla. You see, the gorilla digestive tract is 60% large intestine in comparison to the human digestive tract, which is 67% small intestine. How does that affect the digestion of a gorilla? Well, as you can see right here, sure, the gorilla eats 74% fiber, but after passing through the large intestine, that fiber in those microorganisms in the gorilla's gut actually convert into fat. So the gorilla ends up eating fiber, but absorbs fat. So instead of thinking of you are what you eat, maybe we should think about it as you are what you absorb. So maybe we shouldn't look at what a gorilla eats, and maybe we should look at what humans eat. Now, there's a lot of debate on what's the best diet for you. So Let's start at the beginning. Let's talk about breast milk. Almost everyone agrees that breast milk is the best food for a baby. And if you look at its macronutrient composition, breast milk is mostly fat. Fat is very good for a baby because it's a dense source of nutrients and it helps with things like brain development and hormones. After that, we have carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are like jet fuel. They're very easily processed. And since a baby has very little body fat, it helps the baby keep warm and it helps the baby grow. So should we eat a diet that is distributed like the macronutrients of breast milk for the rest of our lives? Well, not so fast. Macronutrient needs change as you move into adulthood. This is because babies have a higher metabolism than adults. If you look into nature and you see what everything from a rabbit who is a strict herbivore to a tiger who is a strict carnivore is actually absorbing through their different digestive tracts, you can see that it always roughly converts into 20 to 40% carbohydrate, 10 to 30% protein, and then the rest is fat. Now, if we take those numbers of an adult mammal and we compare them to a traditional hunter-gatherer diet, you can see that those numbers fit pretty well. Traditional diets, are mostly fat with 10 to 30 percent carbohydrates and 10 to 30 percent protein. If you follow that logic, your plate should look like this. We can use technology and develop a powder that has that perfect macronutrient ratio with all the vitamins and minerals, but maybe we haven't evolved to just drink our food. And truthfully, that looks disgusting. Now, 
we can make a perfect plate with nothing but butter, something like potatoes and a lean protein, but that would get really boring. Your plate should look more like this. You see, avocados, they have fiber, they have carbohydrates, and they have some fat content. And onions and things like tomatoes also provide with the rest of the carbohydrates. Your veggies should have some drizzling of a natural fat, such as olive oil, in order for you to actually absorb those vitamins, which are only fat soluble. See, this is not a boring diet. So what should we eat to lose weight? You've seen the magazines. Eat this, lose this many pounds. I really don't like that argument because we live in a society where more is more and sometimes that doesn't work out. I prefer this question. What should I avoid to lose weight? And these are the three villains of our story. Grains, sugar, and rancid oils. Let's start with grains. Grains are pro-inflammatory and they contain phytic acid and other anti-nutrients. These anti-nutrients prevent minerals and vitamins from being absorbed in the small intestine. On top of that, they're highly processed and this makes them really palatable, which means that you can eat a ton of them and not get satiated and continue eating, which at the end, you end up eating more calories than you need. The second villain is sugar. Sugar used to be a symbol of affluence. It was really expensive because you have to take the sugar cane, burn it, process it, and then you end up with these little crystals that have basically nothing other than those carbohydrates. Also, sugar is super palatable and highly addictive. Did you know that sugar is useful in diagnosing cancer? If we irradiate sugar and we have a person consume it, and then we put that person through a PET scan, that sugar congregates around where the tumors live because cancer thrives when it feasts on sugar. Kind of scary, isn't it? The final villain is rancid oils. Things like canola oil, soybean oil, especially trans fats. They are highly reactive. These polyunsaturated fats are not very stable. And after we consume them, and we, they go through the hydrochloric acid in our stomach, and then end up circulating in our bloodstream, they react with our artery walls and they create foam and eventually atherosclerosis. So let's put it all together. Cake used to be only reserved for special occasions. Our grandparents probably only had cake during their birthday. Why is that? Well, they had to go harvest some wheat, take it to the mill, make it into flour. Then they had to bring it home, and then take some of the precious milk and butter, combine them, and then that expensive sugar, and then make it all together and present you with a little tiny cake only on your birthday. So everyone would gather around and it would be a special occasion. Compare that to our modern society. We can walk into any store and get either an already prepared cake or a box cake where you just add water and use some rancid oils and some very inexpensive sugar, and you end up with this pro-inflammatory piece of food that we can eat, if we wanted to, every day of the week. And that's another example of how technology can hinder your health. So what's paleo? Well, paleo has very simple rules. It's a low sugar diet that is macronutrient agnostic, because as you age, or as you change your activity levels, or as your disease processes change, we should change our diet. It is most importantly anti-inflammatory. It is guilt-free, and it's comprised of real food, not processed or highly palatable, easy to digest foods. Now, you can't talk about paleo without talking about meat. Animal products are nutritionally dense. They have essential vitamins, such as B12, and truthfully, we have evolved eating meat. They're a good source of omega-3 fatty acids, and they check all the marks as being real food. Throughout this presentation, I told you that you were going to be able to adapt this diet to fit you. So what happens if you're vegan? Well, you can use things such as coconut oil or avocado oil in order to satisfy your need for fats. Those are sources of fat that are non-rancid. 
On top of that, you can use things such as supplements to satisfy your need for B12. And if you are not doing veganism for conscious reasons, you can consider eating mollusks. Mollusks have a very primitive nervous system that doesn't feel pain. So you might see that mollusks might be a little bit more plant than animal. The fact is that paleo diets and vegan diets only have one thing that is not similar, and that is the source of protein. We have more in common, and we should be focused on fighting the standard American diet than in fighting because both diets focus on being a healthy diet, food of low processed food, highly nutritious, and good for you. So let's review how technology can hinder us. And I'm going to give you an example of how we can take advantage of technology to take us back into a healthier state. Do you remember this picture? The collapsed ankles, the low arch. It truly looks like it hurts. This is because the muscles on the feet were atrophied. This person was able to correct that ankle just by using minimalistic shoes and barefoot walking. In essence, he used technology so he could return to nature and become healthier. I'm not advocating for you to move in the middle of the forest on a teepee. We can harness technology and use it to our advantage. For example, we can monitor our weight, our activity, you know, you can track your steps. All of these things can give you a good idea of how healthy you are. And if those trends begin to decline, you can create new strategies in order to bring you back to health. This is a key point in this presentation. We can use this approach to try to decipher the next problem when it comes to health. 